Hello and welcome to our very first episode of Three Skulls Tavern. I'm Matt. Um, I'm the GM, the host of, of this channel. And um, yeah, <laughs> I don't know what to say for an intro. Um, what do people usually say <laughs> in not. intros? I would have been good if I actually did some uh, some research here maybe. But um, basically, um, I'll, we'll, go, we'll do an intro. I'll give an intro myself, then I'll, I'll introduce um, these people over here. Um, yeah, I can't God, see this is really. super informal. We're starting off on a, on a yeah, good phase here. Yeah, informal is good. It's no, a great really, you have a podcast, right, man? I do. Yeah, so thank, thank a you professional. for that segue there, Eric. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I think it's a great intro where you just ask, what the hell should I do for an intro? <laughs> hey, well, <laughs> that's the intro. I mean, I'm clearly well, not really more of tavern where... Yeah. Anyway, no idea what we're anyway, doing. Anyway, so back back on. Um, <laughs> as as Eric alluded to, um, I do uh, run a podcast with my co-host Liam, Mud and Blood, which is um, all about dark and grim tabletop role-playing games. Um, but we're not tied to any one system or anything like that. However, people who listen to the podcast um, or who know me from chatting to me will know that I'm a bit of a fanboy of the um, the company Free League out of Sweden who make um, a bunch of games using what's called the Year Zero engine. Um, as you can see in the middle of the screen here, Forbidden Lands, this is one of their latest games. It's a dark fantasy uh, survival game and a uh, really, good, really fun game. I've been playing it and uh, actually I've never played it. I've been running it uh, since beta um, and it's a great game. I've never run a really long campaign of it though and I've something I've really wanted to do. Um, I'm also doing some game design using the Year Zero engine and I'm basing some stuff off of Forbidden Lands so I thought it'd be really nice to... Um, GM a proper campaign of Forbidden Lands. We're going to be running the, or I'm going to be running the Raven's Purge official campaign um, from Forbidden Lands. Um, so if you're planning on playing in that campaign, maybe you shouldn't um, be watching this actual play. If you're GMing, by all means, maybe there's something you can uh, pick up from this in your own in your own campaign. Um, but basically, yeah, I just wanted really wanted to run it, and I thought, you know, I'm I'm comfortable. Uh, doing podcasting for for a, a fair amount of time now um, with people hearing my voice, which was a little bit weird at first. So why don't I stream it? And that way people can, uh, people want to see a little about Forbidden Lands, you know, help spread the word about this, this really cool game. So here we are. Uh, I've set up this little channel called Three Skulls Tavern, which is a little, there's a little Easter egg there. Um, I don't know if, probably, I can see Eric nodding. Um, he might, he might know the reference. The, uh, Ed's nodding as well. No, Eric doesn't know. I actually don't. Okay. So there's a little Easter egg here. Um, I'll leave it. If you know what it is, then uh, put it in the comments below. <laughs> um, you will probably need to know a little bit about Forbidden Lands to, to catch the Easter egg. But anyway, the name is relevant to something about Forbidden Lands. Um, so, how much more should I say about myself? If you've never listened to Mud and Blood, um, I guess you won't know anything about me. I have been role-playing since the 90s uh, when I first started playing uh, West End Games Star Wars role-playing game. Um, that means I started playing role-playing games with dice pools, big, big piles of D6s, not D&D. &D. Um, so basically I took a break like a lot of people did in the late 90s and the early noughties. And when I got back into role-playing, um, I got into a D&D &D group and didn't really... I, I love the group. They're really great friends and close friends of mine now, but um, yeah, d d didn't do anything for me. Um, but I still played it. I played um, weekly for like three or four years until I started discovering the cool indie scene in, in role-playing and eventually led me to uh, Mutant Year Zero, which uh, was the first game that Free League produced with this using this Year Zero engine I've just been talking about. Um, anyway, um, I bought it a few months after it was released in English and have been playing and running and loving the games by free league ever since so that's me um i've been gming for a long time as well i guess um since i got back into it probably about 10 ish years ago 12 years ago um i've been gming a lot as well as playing a lot um i live and breathe role playing now for the last year and a half since i'm um, starting a podcast so here i am starting something new um in terms of before you introduce the players um one thing I wanted to talk about quickly was things like uh, formats, like how this is going to work with uh, frequency of, of shows and that sort of thing. Um, the idea here is that because I'm still doing this alongside my podcast, which is a lot of work, um, this is only going to be once a month. And while you're watching this now, this has been pre-recorded. We're going to be live streaming all of our future episodes after the prologue 
planning on recording a prologue um, today as well. Um, that prologue will also be pre-recorded, but after that, everything will be live streamed. We'll be throwing links out um, on social media, etc., to to give people plenty of notice on when we're going to be doing that. Um, the idea is, I don't. We don't really know. We haven't really talked about it too much about how long those sessions are going to be. Um, probably two or three hours, like you would normally see for most actual plays. Um, if you feel really strongly about that, you can definitely comment in the in the comments below and let us know if you think that's. Um, yeah, you'd rather see something longer or shorter, whatever. Um, also, social media. I mentioned social media. Um, there's a. Facebook uh, page for this for this channel set up. There's a Twitter channel set up for this, um, and I might be setting up a Discord server if I want to be arsed with um, managing another <laughs> Discord server. <laughs> um, if I do, then if it'll, I'll put it in the description for the show below, and you can just find the links to all that stuff. So, that's really it. Um, I I am thinking about doing some other stuff some other content on this channel other than just this monthly actual play i don't know how much time i'll have for that so i'm not i can't promise anything right now specifically but if i do anything it will be specific to uh free league games so the year zero engine simber room the upcoming um the one ring second edition that sort of thing i might be doing design videos where i'm talking about um, doing some game design using the, the year zero engine these would all be shorter format and possibly i might interview some of the free league people um, about stuff and they would be shorter interviews as well not like the epic two plus hour interviews we do on mud and blood um because it's just me and liam is a much better talker than i am <laughs> um finally if there's interest and if I've got time, I may be willing to GM a, a second campaign um, on alternate. Uh, so like two weeks in between two weeks in between when this one goes live. Um, if I was to do that, it would have to be a system that I'm comfortable with. So I've run before. So I, and I would probably be doing it a bit off the cuff, low prep um, anyway. And that would probably be something like Mutant Year Zero or Coriolis possibly Simbroom because I'm doing a lot of reading of that to review it at the moment. Um, so yeah, if, if you'd like to see a second uh, a second campaign started, also it would be on a monthly basis, then leave a comment in the comments below and I'll think about it. <laughs> That's me. I'll stop talking now and uh, I'll turn it over to the player. So if um, we're, I'll, I'll name you off because you can't um, you can't see the, the order we're in on the um, on the on the video here and what the our viewers can see um but basically if you just give a quick intro about yourselves not your characters just like your gaming background and yeah oh and, and by the way uh, time zone wise i am in germany so i'm in europe over to eric hi i am eric i am in um chicago and uh so yeah as a teenager i um dabbled in role-playing games and never had like a full group it was mostly like me and a friend and maybe like whoever else we could like gather together and uh and uh we did things like um like merp uh oh, we God. looked at uh pen dragon i can't remember which edition it was now third i think and um and yeah we had a lot of fun with it but after high school i kind of just lost track of the whole scene and uh, a few months ago, I started playing again. I found Matt's excellent podcast, Mud and Blood. <laughs> and, uh, Brownie points. Brownie points. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and um, actually, I had come into contact with Forbidden Lands immediately before that. Uh, was really impressed with it. Um, and looking for more information about it kind of led me to Mud and Blood. And so that's kind of expanded my my horizons uh, immensely, and uh, yeah, um, really looking forward to playing this game. I think it's fantastic. I've run it a couple times, um, so so yeah, I'm looking forward to sort of being on the other side of the GM screen and uh, seeing where we go with the Raven's Purge because I haven't done anything with it. So yeah, cool. That's me, Harry. You're next. I am Harry, and I'm from Scotland. Uh, I've played role-playing games for, I'm going to say, the best part of 15 years. I think that's about right. And uh, classic case of having to GM to get, anything, to get anyone to actually play. 
So I haven't actually played many games. I've run lots of games. So when Matt invited me to play a game via uh, Zoom, Discord, such like, it was a delight because I've got nobody around me. <laughs> and uh, Mud and Blood was a was a great was a great podcast to find because I like the actual plays very much, and I'm really pleased to be taking part in one myself. As for Forbidden Lands, I'd never heard of it until until Matt said anything, but <laughs> that doesn't really say anything about Forbidden Lands because I'm absolutely, completely ignorant about nearly everything. <laughs> um, I've never run it, I've never played it, I've hardly <laughs> even looked at the rule book. Um, I'm probably going to be a massive dead weight in terms of learning the rules, but I guess you always need somebody to ask the stupid questions. So. I'll just stop right there with uh, the further intros because it's something I wanted to mention I forgot to earlier on, and that is in this campaign, um, I, I asked, I spoke to um, the Forbidden Lands Facebook group about running this and asked if anybody had any preferences about campaign styles and that sort of thing. And a few, quite a few people came back and said they'd like to see something which was a little bit more instructional. Um, that means this isn't going to be, if you've watched, if you're a regular watcher of actual plays, um, a lot of times, this is no criticism of them, they're a very high in performance. Um, they want it to be an immersive, story-driven, narrative thing that's going on. And you don't necessarily learn a lot about the rules for a game by watching them. You're watching a performance. Um, we're definitely going to be performing. Um, there's, you know, there's a part of we're taking on roles. That, there's, that happens always <laughs> in role-playing games, right? But um, I'm, I've taken that feedback on, on board um, from Facebook. I think it's a really good idea. So we're going to try and slow the pace down a little bit from what you might be used to. Um, that's why you can see the Discord um, bot roller just below my face here. Um, and although it's confusingly showing Mutant Year Zero dice right now, um, as we use it, there will be... Um, the dice will graphically show the results and it will show things like pushing and all the little rules that go along with with forbidden lands so it's very visible to to you and the viewers exactly how these roles um work and how they interact with dice and really we just want to try and make this to be a little bit more educational a little bit more instructional on how forbidden lands works behind under the hood so anyway um and that's why it's it's absolutely fine that harry um hasn't really dug into the rules um, at all or hadn't heard of this game because that means by explaining things to him I'm also explaining them to you if you're also un un unfamiliar so okay <laughs> um, thanks Harry over to Ed um, hi um, I guess I've been role playing since the early 80s um, when a friend of mine turned up from uh, from America with a red box of D&D um, and I haven't stopped since um, <laughs> I, I haven't had any breaks I've pretty much gone through but like Harry I um I pretty much was the GM. Um, it's like, oh, we'll get a group together, let's play. Oh, I can't be bothered. Oh, Ed, you can do it. Uh, which also meant that I get to buy the books and everything else, because, you know, they didn't buy them. <laughs> but that meant that I uh, had a lot of experience doing it. Um, but interestingly, I haven't actually run anything or played anything properly online until Matt very graciously asked me to, to run a, a session uh, or a few sessions of cult for him um and charlotte and harry um so that was very nice um and it's uh kind of catching on i seem to be doing more of it mm -hmm. i'm very grateful that uh matt's asked me to play this um i'm a huge fan of uh free league um i now seem to have all of the game systems um <laughs> uh sponsored quite a few um and this is the first time i've ever played forbidden lands um, I kind of run it just the once. Um, as a one shot? As a one shot, so I didn't really read too much of the rules. Okay. Um, so, uh, why would you? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm looking really looking forward to this. Um, so that's me, really. Cool. Um, and how do you know me, Ed? There's a, there's a personal oh, yes. question here. Too. So yes, there is. I almost forgot about that. So um, <laughs> I uh, set up a, um, a meetup group in, uh, in the UK, um, and uh, Matt was one of my players um, when he was still in the UK, um, and uh, joined my group uh, playing a game of Hunter. Um, he obviously liked it so much that he asked me to uh, play and run <laughs> some other stuff for him. So. Uh, yes, um, we do yeah. have a connection, and uh, I'm very grateful that I've managed to keep in touch with him because now I get to do this. Yeah, we also played um, 
my introduction to oh, Warhammer yes. Fantasy Roleplay was through you. We played. You, oh, yes. you ran a, a first edition, um, Doomstones. Oh yes, yeah, it was like no. it was like two sessions, I think, and then it we, was yeah. I think you didn't want to play it anymore or something. No. I was hooked. I was like, Wolfrop <laughs> is fucking awesome. Oh, we're gonna swear on this channel, by the way. Sorry, didn't mention that before. Uh, <laughs> explicit. Sorry, kids. It's yeah, out. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's just out. Just well, you'll have them all. Um, yeah. I can't so I, that. I love, mm. I love Wolfrop. It's it's one of my. It's setting. It's definitely setting wise. It's my probably my favorite role playing game. Um, I've fallen a little bit out of the out of love with the rules in recent times, like in the last year. Um, <laughs> but I still love it, and I have Ed to thank for that because I had only been, played D and D before and had started getting to the indie scene, which doesn't really touch Wolfrop at all, of course. Um, things like Fate, and so yeah, Ed was my introduction to Wolfrop. And I didn't know that. Yeah, and cool. Like after we played it, like uh, third edition of Wolfrop was out and like almost completed by the time mm -hmm. we started playing. And I was like, what is this awesome game? Where can I get it? I found a, a used copy of the first edition rules. And then um, I realized that third edition was the latest and greatest. I bought everything and ran a third edition campaign for my home group um, a few, like a year later or something. So mm -hmm. anyway, yeah. Cool. cool. Thanks, Ed. And no last problem. but certainly not least, Charlotte. Hey, how's it going? Mm -hmm. All good. Uh... Yeah, it's been a little while since I had to do an intro. Um, <laughs> had some old habits back then. Hi, I'm Charlotte. You can also find me online at Foxfire22 on Twitter and almost like everywhere else. Um, for some of you that have been tuning into Mugblood for a while, you may recognize me from uh, some previous uh, <laughs> podcast recordings of Coriolis uh, and our currently running cult, as well as a few of the Patreon-only uh, one-shots. Yep. Um, I think one of them only so far that was the uh delta green what? i think so okay yeah 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 and then last year if you're uh, familiar with like the other youtube streaming games you may have seen me on a few games on encounter roleplay um what was i on uh darkness I did, yeah the simbroom game with liam uh then we switched over to uh scum and, scum and villainy. villainy and then at that time i was also running my own game of conan 2d20 uh -huh. which was a game that we uh, were able to mix a little bit more with the performance slash rule review. So, uh, cool. it can I used be to done. be able to do long monologues from the Conan film. <laughs> In your gravelly voice. Yeah. Um, to view, so, sorry, Don't Charlotte, we'll, we'll jump back. Harry's Harry's got a bit of a... Hopefully he doesn't have um, COVID-19. Um, <laughs> yes, COVID. COVID, yes. It's just a sore throat, but normally he doesn't Probably. sound this this, uh, this sexy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was true. that was meant to be a compliment. It didn't come out that way. <laughs> Moving swiftly back it over to Charlotte. Uh, no, nearly. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I guess on top of that, um, recently in the last few weeks, I had a bit of a player bio or gamer bio come out, which was posted on Cupel 7s website. If you want to have my real rundown and my history, go read that. That's a lot easier than it is for me to say, well, once upon a time, I bought some books at the store back when I was younger and blah, blah, blah. And then Vampire the Masquerade and all this stuff came in between and stopped playing for a little bit. Uh, go read it. It's, uh, I don't know, I like it, but that's because I wrote it. Um, <laughs> yeah. Not humble at all. Um, <laughs> I actually have something big on in uh, the works right now. Uh, it's called Valkyrie Gaming. It is a uh, a group for women, non-binary, and gender fluid gamers. It is our goal to be able to get like-minded individuals together to talk and learn the game in a setting where they're comfortable in and eventually branching that off into real world where we can have a group of people get together and play without any kind of uh, social bullshit. anxiety for the most part for bullshit yeah. I mean not calling anybody out but it's sometimes hard to be uh, a, a gamer of a minority gender in a gaming store yeah yeah it's just the way it is it's I'm not saying everyone's like that or all places are like that but it is there is a tendency out there uh, so we are looking at um, making a safe place for people to come and play and then you know what it is my theory that the more people do this the more comfortable that everybody's going to be in the long run therefore strengthening and growing all of our gaming communities we're not looking at segregating we're looking at having a bit of a side area for us to teach people 
and to grow our our hobbies and our games. Uh, we started off in the war gaming, like Warhammer 40,000, Malifaux, Infinity, uh, but we're now starting to expand into tabletop role-playing games, board games, basically anywhere that gaming would typically happen in a uh, public setting. So whatever you see at a gaming store is what we're going to be covering. So cool. hopefully in the next few months, once uh, our um, quarantine is lifted, oh, we'll yeah. start to get uh, some some sessions going in the real world. I know my local gaming store, from what I've said, uh, or what I've talked to with them, uh, Red Claw Gaming in Edmonton is uh, a little keen to kind of do something along these lines. So hopefully I'm going to be able to work with them in the future and branch out from there. So uh, any support you want to give us, any information you want to find out uh, on Twitter, you can find us at Valkyrie Gaming Zero because everything else was already taken. Um, <laughs> There's a link to our Discord on there. There's a little bit of information. Uh, on a daily basis, I try and uh, share some uh, information and contributions from the people in our community to, to help spread the word that, you know what, we're not the, the minority gendered demographic in wargaming is not small. We're just scattered. So this will hopefully bring us together and uh, get more people into it. Because the more you have, the funner it is. Yep, absolutely. Cool. Thanks. Yep. So that's us. That's the, the five of us. And if you have any questions, you want to know any more information, um, reach out to us on social media. I'll put links to um, people's various uh, things. Yeah, Charlotte. I got a question. Uh, what is the Twitter link for Three Skulls? It's uh, scrolling in the video, which you can't see, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> okay, right, so for right us under right your head. Now. It's a. Uh, the number three skulls tavern okay. with an at sign of course and that's exactly the same as the facebook um handle um one other three thing that, that cropped tavern. up which i completely forgot about because i haven't actually used it yet um i've set up an anchor um channel for this as well um anchor is a free podcasting platform um and the idea is i'm gonna rip all of our video into audio and i'm gonna upload it on anchor it won't cost me anything it doesn't look particularly pretty their interface but it will go out to all the podcasting platforms. So if people don't want to watch a video for these episodes, they can actually um, subscribe to a podcast feed of it and they'll get the audio that way. So, well, so maybe we should call out our dice rolls then. We and definitely will be talking yeah. them through. We'll definitely be talking them through. Cool. It's also something okay. to bear in mind for us as players is that um, there will be an audio version of this. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. So I'll try and talk through things that are being shown um, visually. Um, but yeah. The, the primary format of the show is is YouTube, is visual. Um, mm -hmm. But we are definitely, I'm definitely keen to, to make sure that audio is supported as well. Because I run an audio podcast, I understand. Yeah, I find it easier to listen to a three-hour audio pod, um, actual play than a, a three-hour visual one. So if you're watching this, that's not to say don't watch this one. <laughs> I'll stop again. <laughs> Digging a hole for myself. Okay, so I've, I've got a little outline in front of me of the stuff I need to talk through through session zero. So we'll move on to the next bit, which is um, the social contract. If you have no idea what that is, um, basically in a nutshell, this is where we talk about things that... Um, yeah, how we play together. This includes things like taboos, um, things that might make people feel uncomfortable. If you're playing uh, like f physically at a table with people, you'll often have discussions about who who brings food, whether you can eat food, is alcohol allowed, um, all that kind of stuff. The, the, basically, at a session zero, it's really important to to kind of lay down some ground rules so everybody knows like what's what and feels comfortable playing. So um, I'll kind of guide us through the various um, kind of prompts I've got here for this. It's made a little bit easier because I've, um, I've played in a horror game, Cult, with Harry, Ed, and Charlotte. So we've done a very detailed um, social contract <laughs> when we did Cult. And I kind of know a lot about them. But um, I have never played with Eric before. In fact, none of us have. So um, we're going we're gonna to kind of try and cover all this very generally. So the first thing I want to talk about is taboos. Um, obviously, if there's something you're not comfortable talking about taboo-wise, um, like on video, then you can tell me about it afterwards. I haven't, I haven't um, sent you any messages about this in advance. Um, but the, the two main ones that I won't be going, I won't be touching on um, during this campaign are um, sexual violence and child abuse. So, um, 
yeah this being like a, <laughs> a, great. a fantasy sort of setting obviously people <laughs> might want to see like oh there's been pillaging and rape or something that's not gonna happen mm. in this campaign um, probably won't even happen off screen I don't I don't want to use that as a kind of shock shock um, shtick or whatever you want to call it mm -hmm. um, also apologies for my language um, I am a native English speaker but I've been living in Germany for three years and sometimes I forget what things are called <laughs> it happens <laughs> um, child abuse uh, I, I have a three of uh, he's actually four now he's I've got a four-year-old child um, myself and I don't really find it particularly amusing or it makes me feel uncomfortable to um, think about children being abused so I definitely won't be doing it and I won't be <laughs> if any players try and bring it up I'll be I'll be washing it down straight away <laughs> yeah yeah so that's good are good. there any good other <laughs> Are there any other taboos that people want to that people want to talk about? And people might be laughing. And if you if you're not that familiar with role playing games, this is something that uh, seriously can happen in a role playing game, um, especially if something is a bit on the darker side or horror. Um, people mm -hmm. can de reach into some very dark places. If you've ever watched a horror film, you, child abuse it's and true. sexual sure. violence is yeah. in a lot of films, um, yeah. and people will use it. So, yeah. Anyway. So anyone, any one of you, feel free to speak up. If there's anything else that um, that you're comfortable speaking about now, obviously if there's something you don't want to talk about but want to let me know about, um, let me know offline, and we can, I'll make sure to make sure that I'm, I'm aware that that needs to stay out. Uh, assuming this is going to be mostly for mature um, yeah. viewers, um, I'm fairly happy with anything, and I will happily. Uh, I don't have any problems with pretty much everything else, obviously, by what you've already said. So, okay. Yeah, I mean, if I was going to give anything, it would probably be the two examples you already put out there. So I'm, I'm, I'm fine. Okay. Yeah, I think, uh, Matt, you and I, our preferences overlap a lot. So I don't expect that I'll need to add anything. Okay. Charlotte? Yeah, I'm good with what's been said already. I mean, there was a few things that I went into a little bit more in depth when we're doing our cult game. But yeah. having to deal with some of those issues in the game itself, I... Yeah. They're... they're while they may be problematic in my real life, um, they don't essentially trigger me when we're in game. So okay. pretty much just the sexual violence and the uh, damage against kids. Cool. All right. Saying that, um, I do want to have a little X card sort of thing in place just in case. Um, and I'm saying this because this is a dark game and I want to run it dark. I don't want to... I don't want to it's not to say we can have we can have some comedy and some some humor in in it at appropriate times i know i can see harry grinning um but i I'm do so want to almost treat this as um as a kind of light horror game because it is a very very dark setting and <coughs> it really i think um it's easy when you're playing fantasy to get caught up in the fantasy and to ham it up sometimes and that's fine if we get if we go there but i will be trying to introduce some light horror elements so um, I'm not going to say exactly what that means but um, because obviously it would kind of ruin it a little bit um, <laughs> but I do I do want this to be a slightly darker actual play so yep. that's why I'm bringing this up and making it like talking about X cards um, there may be something I touch on that you might not realize that you have a problem with um, and an X card if you're not familiar is um, normally it'd be like a little card you would hold up um, yeah with an X a big X on it there's no X on that but yeah imagine <laughs> do it so you would basically do that and that would just ba basically say like i'm not comfortable with what's happening right now skip sk like skip what to the next it? scene yeah um <laughs> that's why i want to turn over to you um to you for um because i would like some something in place it could we i've heard people talk about before like a red amber green system for red is absolutely stop in your tracks no further amber is i'm feeling quite uncomfortable about this um like no more extreme than what we're currently dealing with and ideally slow down and change scenes when appropriate and green is i don't know what you like green like no, no. Yeah. i think it's more like amber and red i think more than anything mm. but i don't um, that's i think that's more for proper horror games like where you're yeah, getting deep yeah. into it i don't think that's necessarily needed here necessarily so what do people think about it um i think just a matter of for me it would just be a matter of saying can we just stop there for a second yeah um, yeah and that's fine. I'm thinking about the audio, how we're, because we're going to do this over audio okay. as well. 
that's well, um, yes, yeah, if we're no, saying that, that works is what yeah. I mean. Like if someone holds up an X card, then um, and we and I abruptly stop. Yeah. People who are listening and not watching yeah. will kind of wonder what's just happened. So, yeah, that makes sense. Is everyone comfortable um, with that? Actually, actually saying that. Yeah, I mean, even saying something. Um, I need to take a break for a minute. Sure. Because then that'll be transferred along to audio, knowing that hey, I'm stepping away. Yeah. Meanwhile, while on yeah. video, if we're doing like the big hand X or something, or holding mm -hmm. up a card or something like that, yeah. then it covers off on that at the sure. same time. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And you can do that, like do a big X or something as you're getting up. Like I'm not comfortable with this. I need a minute or two. Yeah, yeah I guess five. if we're then not comfortable with it, if we do step away, the rest of us can then continue with it, and then the other person can come back. I, I'm not sure. Like, I think it depends or... what it is. Like, yeah. honestly, I don't see myself going into really dark places because I'm not like that. Yeah. Um, and I know the three of I know three of you well from from playing cult. I know that's not something that I expect to come up. And Eric, you seem like a nice guy, but who knows yeah. what's lurking below that that pleasant who exterior? Knows? That pleasant. How exterior. am I so nice? <laughs> yeah. To be fair, Matt, you only know me on my best behavior. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> Harry's letting loose. <laughs> um, so I, I kind of, I'm hoping it won't be an issue. But if it is, I, I, I'm not sure that we would continue on because I don't know how our viewers, okay. I mean, viewers could always just skip the yeah. video yeah. Um, or audio. But um, okay. we'll, we'll play it by ear as we go. Yep. Mm. Okay. Um, point of housekeeping then for this bit as well. Um, eating and drinking i've been sipping a beer as we've been going because it's um late at night for me um drinking's fine obviously we're doing a lot of talking if you need to if you need to drink tea or water or beer or whatever you want that's absolutely fine um food however is um it, it's a big pet peeve of mine um and i know that uh having having mentioned it a number of times online a lot of people have an issue with that when they're when they're watching something that's being broadcast um, about hearing people eat because you have a microphone in your face and it gets picked up and it goes straight into the the ear canals of people listening and it's not nice so <laughs> so Harry. The, the the rule here the rule here is um please try and eat before we before we stream and if you can't or you need a little bit of like um some some sugar or like energy or whatever um mute your mic and and do it that way so we're not um you're not crunching into everyone's ears <laughs> um and the last thing to talk around here from my perspective with housekeeping is player absences um i am happy to run a session as long as we have at least one player that might sound a bit weird <laughs> but i honestly i've i've run it i've run a one-on-one -on -one. i was i'd always been afraid of them i'd actually run one um last year and it was awesome and I'm no longer afraid of them. I think they're really great. And we can do, we can go into little character vignettes. We can do flashbacks to the back, the backstories of people. As long as we have one player, we're going to continue with our live streams at the regular, like monthly slots. Mm -hmm. If something happens where nobody's available, obviously we'll have to reschedule. And I, it may be that we have a whole like two months where nothing happens. It's, it's quite possible. Um, so that's just something I wanted to mention with absences. If okay. we're if only one person is not here and we're continuing with a regular campaign, um, how do people feel about their their player character being um, or themselves being absent? Like, what would you like to happen with your player character? Any preferences? Because there's a few ways you can handle this. We can do the kind of um, the kind of meta step back from the story a little bit and just ignore that character as if they're not there, which I'm not a huge fan of. Um, we could come up with some reason together about why that character is not in the story for that for that session. Or another option is to hand the reins of that character over to somebody else to control for that session. Um, with the proviso that they don't, the person controlling that character doesn't take any <laughs> stupid risks, even if it is in character, right? Yeah. Um, I yeah, don't know. Ed. I mean, well, I do prefer the latter. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I know Ed does because when I when we ran um, Hunter, he nearly had my my player killed when I couldn't make a session. <laughs> <laughs> Harry, happy. Charlotte. I'm very happy with uh, having somebody else uh, work my character like a hand puppet. Um, I'm also, if we can find a, like a, a, a sensible reason why my character is not around, then I'm very happy with that too. Sure, I, I'm easy going. I think generally, if there's a like, if we've if we've ended a session with a, a period of downtime or something, then that's absolutely fine. If we've ended it on a cliffhanger, it's kind of hard to do that, right? Like, yeah, oh, my character's got a cold. This... Yeah, exactly. 
um, your character is probably going to be there. But if there's obviously if there's a, a natural ending place in the previous session, then ignoring that character, having them like just not there, is is absolutely fine. That can make a lot of sense. Um, Charlotte, yep. any preferences from you? I'm kind of with uh, Harry on this one. If there's a way to get my character out of it, then I prefer to have her out of it. You know what? If I'm sure. going to fail and fuck things up, I want to do it on my own yeah. dice rolls, <laughs> not someone else's. Because as we know, my characters tend to die. Um, <laughs> Spoilers. I want that on me. Um, <laughs> but like you said, if we're ending a previous session in combat, there's no real way to get out of it. So then yeah. at that point. Yeah. And you'll know from... You'll know from Coriolis, um, Charlotte was a player in the Coriolis campaign that I ran. Um, she didn't die. Um, <laughs> Good, but I, I never it really yet. ended it on on cliffhangers, other than right at the end. Like our last two sessions were kind of a long session connected, so that kind of the penultimate one ended on a cliffhanger. Um, I kind of like to bring th to find natural ending places in a um, in a session, so. I'm thinking maybe it'll be all right that it won't be such an issue. But obviously, if if there's if you're traveling between places, this is a survival game. We'll get to that in a second. Um, it might make sense for your character to be involved with like um, making survival rolls and stuff as as we're journeying. And that might mean when you take control of your character back, they might have some conditions or a little bit of damage. Hopefully, some willpower points as well. But anyway, okay, cool. Um, does anybody else want to talk about anything around social contract stuff? No, I'm good. All good. Okay. I. Yeah. I just want to say that um, I have been known to go off on a tangent, and uh, I won't resent anybody if you tell me <laughs> to shut up and focus. <laughs> I. I'm aware of that. I have some foibles, and please, all of you, feel free just to. Let I've, me know. I've played in the, I've played in a one shot and a campaign with you, Harry. I wouldn't have asked you to come back if it was problematic. <laughs> Don't I'm worry. I'm almost flattered. <laughs> <laughs> there was yeah. definitely like a compliment the hidden there somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Again, not moving problematic. Swiftly on. I'm gonna get that on a T-shirt. That's the, that's the drinking game for this uh, channel. Is every time I say "moving swiftly on," you take a drink. <laughs> <laughs> How many times do I put my foot in my mouth? Okay. Nah. <laughs> All right, let's move to the next uh, thing to go through with session zero. Um, and that is basically an introduction to the game and the mechanics, a little bit a bit about the setting. And then we'll talk a little bit about the characters. And that's basically it. Um, so I'll go fairly, give a fairly whistle stop rattle through the game. Um, the game itself, Forbidden Lands, um, is, as you can see from the artwork in the middle of the screen there, it's a dark fantasy game. Um, it looks like there are people riding around on giant two-legged lizards all over the place. It's not really the case, um, <laughs> although the artwork is really cool. Um, the idea behind this game is that the, the themes behind it, so what this game is all about, the thing that makes it different to every other fantasy role-playing game out there, um, and I'm going to read these, um, these kind of headers from the, the first uh, section of the player's handbook, um, are the themes from the book. And those are exploring the world, so exploration is a big part of this game, uh, discovering adventure sites. Adventure sites, there are three types. They are dungeons, villages, and castles, I believe. Is it castles or ruins? Oh, castles. Um, and everyone should be pretty much aware of what those three different things mean, right? Um, so the idea is that when you go and have like a little adventure, like a, a dungeon crawl, to use that term, it's not necessarily, or like a, an adventure that's away from exploring and survival, it's going to be in one of these three types of adventure sites. Um, so discovering them and obviously exploring them. Um, the, the other one, the third one is uncovering the secrets of the land. That takes, um, that takes form in legends. Um, there are lots of legends about this land that you can learn. There's ways to generate, there's tables for generating random ones. We'll come to that later. Um, and the final bit, the header in the book is a bit spoilery, so I'm, I'm not going to, I've, I've changed the wording of it a little bit. Um, that's, but partake in the Raven's Purge campaign, um, whatever that might involve. So don't look in the, in the player's handbook, please, players, um, to see what it says there. Um, 
but yeah, <laughs> I'll try and I'll try and reveal what that little bit is fairly early on, so that you know, it's fairly high level. Um, so that's the, those are the themes of the game, right? And within the within the context of that, um, the the tagline for this game is, God, I've cropped the image. It's it says it usually at the bottom of this image, uh, raiders, raiders and, and raiders rogues. in a. Yeah something land in a broken land i think something yeah like a cursed or, and a cursed yeah, or something broken like land that, something yeah. like that so the idea is that you're not playing heroes you're not it's there's a lot of moral gray this is very typical of free league games by the way um and you're you're there you're in this land to explore to loot sites that sort of thing and make a name for yourself um <laughs> Moving swiftly into mechanics, one of the mechanics for this is a stronghold mechanic, um, which I'm hoping we'll get into as well. And that basically means there there's a whole chapter in the book about how to how to either find a place to make into a stronghold or build a stronghold from scratch. And the idea is that's where your money goes because this this is a broken land. You can't if you find a village, they're basically scraping by, right? It's there's no thriving trade going be, like across the whole land. You can't go to a blacksmith in a village you stumble into and say, "Hey, will you buy this um, this breastplate that I looted out of this cave?" They're gonna be like, uh, "Sure, I'll I'll give you a shovel for it because I'm gonna melt it down and make six shovels out of it or something." Right? There's no there's no like um, high fantasy economy going on. So so the idea behind the stronghold is it gives players um, a, a, a wave to spend their their in game money on. And that's like upgrades and paying wages to the people who are taking care of your stronghold while you're out adventuring and getting more money. Um, it's a dice pool system. So D6s, um, uh, which is six-sided dice, uh, are what are rolled. And we'll get into that a little bit later. But basically, your character is made up of um, four abilities, which give um, a specific type of dice. They have um, a set of 16 skills, which are tied to those, um, those attributes. Did I say abilities? Anyway, attributes are called. Um, and those skills give you a different colored dice. And then finally, if you have any gear that you can use, it gives you a third colored dice. So there are three different colored dice. And you roll all those together. All you need to have is a six in your pool of dice that you've rolled. And it's just one six is a success. More sixes um, increases the magnitude of your success. And sometimes there are opposed roles where the opponent that you're that you might be rolling against, for example, in combat or in a social situation, they might also roll their own pool of dice. And in that case, it's whoever has the most number of sixes. So, in that case, obviously, just rolling one six might not be enough. Um, you can re-roll. We'll talk about this as we start in the game. Um, but you can re-roll your um, you can what's called push your roll to re-roll. If you do that, you risk um, some of the ones are kept behind. And when you push that roll, if those ones, um, those ones then can either damage your attributes, which is how you take damage, or they can damage your equipment. Um, unlike D&D, you don't get more health or anything um, as you gain experience in advance your character. You, are, you have your four attributes, which are going to be arranged from two to five, no higher. And they will never go up the entire campaign, regardless of how much it, um, how much XP I'm giving out. Um, so you're you're consistently squishy in this game. So this is definitely one of those types of games where running away should always be a valid option. It's a gritty <laughs> and dangerous game. Um, there are critical roll tables, several of them. So if, if somebody hits you with um, really hard and you get broken, you fall down, then you roll on a critical injury table. It could be instant death. It could be losing a limb or it could be just a, a knock on the head and you're stunned for, for like a round, something like that. Um, magic is is deadly, dangerous, a little bit wild. Um, Charlotte, we'll be getting to this shortly, but Charlotte is going to be playing a, um, a sorcerer. Um, so we're, we will have magic as a um, as an element of this game, just because she's going to be she's going to be playing that role. Um, and that's basically it. One other thing I guess we can talk about is willpower points very briefly. Um, <laughs> willpower points are when you take damage from from pushing your roll to re-roll and you take damage, you might think, well, why would I ever push my roll? Like, what's the point of doing that? Every time you, you take damage from doing that, you get a willpower point. And you can spend those willpower points on talents, specifically kin, which are is the, basically your race, your fantasy race or your human race, whatever, um, and your professions, like your class. You get a talent for each of those, at least one, 
for profession wise anyway and those are very very strong talents very powerful talents and because of that you can't just use them whenever you need to power them with willpower points so you have to the idea is that you have to push yourself to the breaking point to be able to like really do incredible things and that also willpower points are also used by magicians mm -hmm. or sorcerers so I, there's this a, a very common criticism in the game is that um, people who are used to high fantasy games say why can't my sorcerer player character just use magic from the beginning it's ridiculous it's like well it, this was a design decision very specifically like that i'm not, I'm not going to be changing that um the idea is they wanted characters to be a bit more like gandalf and that's the example that they've given in the past and that is gandalf didn't go running into a, a combat throwing spells around he goes run, ride, riding in on on his horse whatever the white horse's name was um i was going to say Halifax. Halifax. Yeah. Cat what? Halifax. Halifax. It's definitely Halifax. Shadowfax. Not yeah. the not the town <laughs> in, in uh, Yorkshire. Um writing uh, it on I Shadowfax. Think Halifax would be a little bit more known in Canada. New Brunswick. Yeah. I've been to a Halifax. No, Nova Scotia. In what am I talking about? Anyway, yeah. Halifax. It's not Halifax, <laughs> it's Shadowfax. He goes riding yeah. in on this horse with a staff in one hand and his sword in the other. And he's laying in with his sword. And the magic only comes out at really big moments. And that's the inspiration a little bit behind how magic works here. So, again, the idea is you've got to get stuck in. You've got to get involved in combat. You've got to hurt yourself before you get the willpower to cast your magic. And magic is dangerous. And we'll, we'll go into magic a lot more when we're actually using it. Okay? That's... I, that's more than enough of what I want to talk around with mechanics. Journeying, I've, I've mentioned before, is a big part of this. There's a, a lot to do with um, rolling for foraging for foods, making camp, um, all this kind of stuff. There are, you know, seasons come into play, the weather comes into play, all sorts of stuff come into play. So that's a big part of this game as well. We are going to be we are going to be looking into that, um, especially more at the beginning when equipment is a little bit less um, reliable <laughs> and you don't have as much. I think end game to use that term when when people are a little bit more experienced um you're able to you'll have a bit more money you'll have a bit more resources etc we might hand wave a little bit of the journeying but to start off with we're definitely gonna be showcasing that those are the mechanics um house rules for those who are interested in forbidden lands i will be doing a few house rules um i may introduce some house rules after we start playing that i haven't thought of at the moment um, i have run this many times i've hacked the system for my own campaign for my own setting as well um, so I'm very familiar with the rules. I'm very I'm very happy to get in and change them. It's a very modular system, easy to hack. Um, so while I think I'm going to keep it as close to rules as written as possible, um, there are a few things I want to change, and I'll just quickly mention those. Um, I'm going to slow down the rate of um, how much XP you get. In the book, there are a bunch of um, prompts for, have you done this in a session? Have you done this in a session? And each time you can answer yes, you get one XP. Um, it means that theoretically, if we did accomplish a lot in a session in terms of like your character development and seeing a lot of things, you could get six or seven XP um, in a single session, which is quite a lot. Um, yeah, Eric's, Eric's, Eric's done this. We've had. This I've never seen before. it, but it could happen. No, but people say it. I've never actually seen <laughs> yeah. that much happen either. I think the max I've seen in a session was five, maybe with one player. Everyone wow. like everyone else had three or four. <laughs> Yeah, um, it yeah is three possible. or four is typical. And yeah. it's usually people who are really playing up and like trying to get into their um, their pride and their dark secret and pushing at every opportunity. Like, how can I max out on this XP? Um, anyway, um, it does it can lead to characters getting quite powerful, buying powerful talents very very quickly in the game. And it doesn't, in my opinion, doesn't make for what feels like a natural progression of, of character. So I'm slowing that down. Um, that means there's going to be. And I'm actually, I'm actually stealing Eric's. Um, Eric's. I've I've lo looked at lots of different ways of handling this in the past. I've done lots of different ways of handling this in the past. Um, Eric's come up with a really um, elegant way of, of looking at it, where there's a maximum of three XP you can get in the session. And Eric, why don't you why don't you mention it since it's your idea? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So yeah, this is a house rule that I've used before, where you have one point for discovery. As sort of going out into the world, discovering new places. Uh, mechanically, this is a hex crawl type game, so moving into a new hex counts as exploration. Maybe you discover a new type oh, of an adventure monster. site. I think an adventure site would count towards that as well, potentially. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. That's one point. You do that. Another point is overcoming challenges. This could be uh, social conflict, it could be uh, life and death, like fighting combat. Um, 
anything, yeah, that, that puts your characters in serious peril overcoming that, that's an experience point. Uh, and the final one is character development. This is sort of yeah. um, acting with your pride, um, confronting your dark secrets, or anything else that seems to be really significantly moving along like your character arc. And that would be a, an, another point. So that yeah. gives you up to three points per session. Yeah. Cool. I'm not going to talk about how advancement works because that's five minutes of a rabbit hole I don't want to necessarily go down. But um, yeah, with two or three experience points per session, um, there's not going to be the possibility of, of advancing very quickly. Um, to offset that, because that is how the game is designed, I'm going to be giving all of you a little bit of an experience boost at the beginning. Okay? Um, because normally you'd expect after one or two sessions to be spending some XP and buying some usually like talents and stuff. That's probably not going to happen for maybe three or four sessions. So to get around that, um, I, I want to make your characters a little bit more capable. And because people generally spend their XP on talents because they tend to have um, a little bit more bang for your buck, um, I'm going to allow all of you to have two free skills. Ooh. We'll talk about how that works in a second, but the, the okay. idea is they have to be two separate skills. So you can't put two points in the same skill. Oh. And you can't, by adding these points, you can't put any skill above three. So if you have a skill at three, okay. you can't make it four, for example. And the idea is either if you, if, if you're, we've done random character generation, and if you have, I know, I know one or two of you are a little bit siloed in with um, a lot of points into one or two places and not a lot of extra spread. And if you want to make yourself a little bit more generally useful, um, this would be the time to do that. Or if you want to just keep boostering, you know, whatever. Up to you how you want to sure. do that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one thing. The second thing I wanted to talk about was, um, it's a very minor thing, but there's um, combat is fairly traditional in uh, Forbidden Lands. And that means it has actions and turns and initiative, although they're not handled necessarily in the way that most, like you don't roll for initiative. Anyway, we'll get into that again later. One thing that doesn't exist in the game as written is a wait action. That means um, if in combat you're first in the queue, but you there's like a dragon or like somebody riding some kind of lizard, flying lizard, is coming towards you in the distance, <laughs> and you're like, well, I want to wait and like until that until that lizard thing has its turn before I do anything. Can I wait? Rules as written don't say anything about it, so it's up to GMs to kind of figure out how to do that. So. I wouldn't say that the book doesn't say you can't wait. It just doesn't address it. So I'm addressing it here with a house rule. And that is very simply, you can take a wait action. Um, if you wait and act later in the initiative order, that becomes your new initiative. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, you have to give a condition for how that's met. So you have to say, I'm going to wait to do until this specific thing happens. Um, and if you if you if that condition is not met and you don't take that that action that you've mentioned, then you lose your entire turn, but you keep your spot in the initiative order for the next round. So there's a bit of a risk there. Like, do you want to wait? Like, what if that lizard? You're waiting for that lizard. The 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 guy riding the lizard sees you waiting and decides, ah, I'm not going to go after. I'm going to do something else. Like, I as a GM, if it makes sense, I might. I feel a bit like I might be screwing you over, but um, we'll see. Play it by ear. I'm a. I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not in the, in the business of screwing my players over at all. Don't worry. This is all collaborative. And the last thing I've got my on my list is um, to do with um, advancement again. Uh, in the in the book, it says when you're taking when you're when you're taking when you want to take your first point in a new skill, you have to have used that skill. Um, at least once, right? So you've tried it, and that means after trying it, you can then say, okay, I learned from, I've learned from that attempt, regardless of whether you succeeded or failed. I'm taking that a step further and saying, if you want to increase any skill and any talent, you have to have give, you have to give some narrative justification on what had happened in, um, in the story recently that you were able to, like, you either tried that and you failed or succeeded, or you met somebody who taught you something that's absolutely fine there has to be a narrative justification you can't all of a sudden say yeah. i want to i want to buy an, a point of xp in melee because i think there's a big fight coming up 
but I've not done anything. I'm not picked up a weapon at all right. in the previous sessions. Yeah. I'm going to say, well, no. Yeah. How are you? How are you all of a sudden skilled in melee? Yeah. Um, we're going to avoid that, and this is very common. in A lot of role playing games they have they have <clears> mechanics <throat> and um, you know rules for how to manage this. I'm going to try and just keep it simple by saying yeah. there needs to be narrative justification in what you've done previously. Okay. I like that your house sense. rules, Matt. Yep. I like them. Um, they feel familiar. <laughs> I've, I've written my last one down, and I, I don't understand what I've written. <laughs> Learning new wits. <laughs> Gets one. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Make the wits roll. When you're learning a new uh, talent, mm -hmm. or you want to learn a new talent, you have to make a wits roll. If you fail the wits roll, you, don't, you lose the XP, and you don't get the talent. Ooh. That is pretty bloody harsh, especially if wits is your dump stat, right? Um, so to this is a house rule. Um, I can't remember if I came up with it. We, it was in a big discussion, I think a year ago or so, um, on the forums, I believe. Um, and the, the solution to this that I think is that every time you make a wits roll for that talent and you fail, you get advantage the next time you, you test it. And that cool. stacks. So if you've if you failed twice for the same talent, you're learning from your mistakes. That means the next time you get two advantage when you're when you're okay. testing it. So eventually, hopefully, you should be rolling <laughs> a pretty bloody big pile of dice to learn that new talent because you keep trying and trying and trying. Okay. Sorry, did you say that you lose the experience even if you fail? Oh, I'm, I'm not checking my book. I'm pretty uh, sure that's yeah. I'm pretty did, sure he, you, you can he, fail he, it, but you don't lose the XP okay. until you get it. Unless it's a new house rule. <laughs> that's fine i don't mind i mean it's fine if you want house rule though i've just yeah i'm just gonna double check that because yeah i don't um <laughs> learning a new talent costs three xp it requires practice and successful wits roll it doesn't really say what happens if you if you if you fail other than like you just think you could try again the next day or the next quarter day whatever um, yeah, so so there's no you don't lose the XP. Apologies. Yep, you're right, Eric. Thank you. Um, but you can only it takes one quarter day to, to do that. Also in the rules with advancement, I'll just mention it now. Um, you're supposed to have rested and it um, like have a quarter of a day to to advance. So that means you can't all of a sudden you've got the XP. Ding! You're up um, in the middle of a uh, in the middle of a dungeon or something, and it's like, oh, guess what? I now have an extra dice towards whatever. Yeah. Um, that makes sense. Yeah. So that's that's already coded into the rules. Um, I'm going to take it a little bit of a step further, and I won't actually grant any XP until downtime as well. Um, cool. Or no, actually, I'll, I'll grant XP at the end of a session, I think. Or milestone. Okay. We'll see. I'll be a bit loose with this, probably. I'm easy. <laughs> that's, it for, that's it for the introduction to the game. Setting-wise, a very quick intro to the setting. Um, the Ravenlands is the name. Of, in fact, I've got a little map here I'm going to bring up, so give me one second. Not that any of you can see it. Ooh, we can pretend. <laughs> There's the map. Um, it's got hexes on it. So this is a hex crawl style game. Um, ties back to kind of the old school um, style games that had hex crawl maps or hex maps. Um, this uh, this area is called the Ravenlands. I'm not going to go into the history of it and all the rest of it. Basically, all you need to know is that there was something called the Blood Mist, which covered the entire land for 300 years in this mist and basically people who stayed at home would um i think it was only at night as well when the mist would come out um people who would stay at home at night would be fine nothing would happen to them at least from the mist right but if you went out if you left your hearth and you went traveling at night you would be the you wouldn't always be killed but there's very 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 strong likelihood that you would not survive and something about this mist would tear people apart. Um, as a result, uh, the only there was one kin who none none of the four of you are a part of, but um, basically called the wolf kin. We're basically like werewolf people, kind of. Um, and they are they were immune to the um, to the blood mist. And also one faction within the game called the Rust Brothers. The Rust Brothers were also immune to the blood mist. Everyone else weren't. <laughs> um, Five years ago, if we take the point of when this game is going to start, the blood mist started thinning, and eventually 
now is more or less gone away. There are patches every now and again. There's rumors that it, it can be found in some places, but more or less, over the course of the past five years, it's receded to the point that it's more or less gone now. As a result, things have started changing in the Ravenlands. People have come back into it from, from outside. People are now trying to set up trade links and things, but it's still very, very, um, you know, recent when, when all this stuff had happened. The four of you, as players, are people who have lived in the Ravenlands already. You're not, you're not strangers coming in from a different place. You have all grown up or were born somewhere in the Ravenlands. And over the course of the past five years, you've slowly been been a part of the kind of, you know, exploring a little bit, going away from your from your homes. And that's how you obviously have met each other because you're all from different kins, more or less. Two of you are. Um, yeah, that's kind of it for for the setting. Um, there's a bunch of a bunch of kin, um, which are which is the word for races in this. We have humans. We have elves. We have dwarves. We have half elves. I mentioned the wolf kin. We have orcs. We have goblins. And there's one missing. Half, half elves. Did I say half elves already? Halflings. Halflings. Oh, Liam's going to love that I, I didn't mention halflings. <laughs> it's halflings. actually a pity we don't have any to show them yeah. off. Yeah. But... Yeah, well. I I can always <laughs> kill one of your characters and roll a new one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. You know, don't count your chickens. Yeah. Um, yeah, probably good. So there are eight playable great. eight playable kin in this game. Those are all mm -hmm. playable. There are a few extra kin as well. There are things like um, ogres, and I don't want to say too much because it might be spoiling the the setting a little bit for some of you. Um, but there are additional kin beyond those eight that are that are out there as well. So there's a very very um, high fantasy and feel or familiar fantasy and feel. That's where it stops feeling familiar. Everything about these um, these kin is non Tolkien esque. They all have a funny little twist to them that make them feel very unique. In fact, this setting was written by a professional uh, fantasy novelist, um, Eric Granstrom, who, yeah, who came up with all this. So it's it it feels very very well developed. It is very well developed, um, and it has a very unique flavor to it, which is very cool. Um, other than that, there's a bunch of factions, there's a bunch of gods, all the stuff you usually see in a fantasy game. I want a lot of that to be organically explored as we play the game rather than me just list it off right now. That's mm -hmm. basically what most people will need to know, including you as players, about the setting. So, that's me done talking for a bit. We're <coughs> right around the one hour mark. Um, so I'm just kind of aware that I don't want to have this go on for too much longer. Why don't um, we turn it over to the four of you to start talking about your characters. Um, one thing I do want to talk about is group concept. Um, this is something I feel very strongly about in any game I play, is that the first part of character creation should be discussing a group concept. I, I'm not a big fan, I'll try not to preach right now about it, but I'm not a big fan of <laughs> people who create characters in a vacuum and then try and come up with some reason why they're all meeting in a tavern or whatever. I prefer people to. I prefer to have a strong group concept that we then work around. It's a little bit different here because this has um, very, very amazing tables for random character generation um, that are too good to ignore. So we've ignored group concept in this instance, which is what I would normally do. We've rolled rand. Um, everyone's rolled randomly for their characters. Um, we've done that offline, so we're not going to do it now. Um, and one of the things we roll when we do that is how everyone met so the group concept is something that has kind of been i mean the group concept is your explorers in this land right you're raiders and rogues in a cursed land that's that's basically the group concept um but yeah that's that's something i want to kind of get out of the way so we'll turn it now over to the four of you um and we'll go down again we'll, we'll start with the reverse order now so it's not always um charlotte going last um charlotte why don't you introduce your character to us and really i'll just give the name um the kin the profession and i don't know anything any other little like details you want about your character uh sure uh i am going to be playing lyria the half elf blood sorceress so we'll see what that means. Um, I actually struggled to kind of come up with a bit of a background for the character. Uh, just kind of starting to get things settled in now. Um, 
We got there though. Just got there though. In time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, honestly, I cannot remember the roles that we made for uh, how we know each other. Uh, I got all that. Don't worry. We'll, t we'll talk to okay. that. We'll talk. Um, the, the how you met element of that, don't need to mention that now. The idea was it's meant to give me an idea for what kind of scenario, um, potentially starting scenario, um, but also also for you as well to think about maybe if there's some some very clear connections between you but we'll talk about right. that and we'll talk about that a little bit later cool uh yeah so i guess going into a little bit of details my character um she grew up in a uh village of uh, mixed half elf and human um villagers um we just kind of worked out uh that she would be somewhat important in the town, like a uh, an advisor role to the chieftain or mayor or whatever the setup was. Um, that was a... Uh, I think we worked it in that it was a uh, hereditary title of sorts, but it's one that she is uh, suited pretty decently to based upon the stats that I have rolled for her. Um, Yeah, she spent some time in uh, the army wanting to get out and stretch her legs a little bit after being uh, cooped up in the village for um, quite some time well basically since birth until the last five years uh, and being an adult uh, half elves age a little bit slower than what humans do so I mean she's seen groups of what what others may call friends like human friends grow up and hit adulthood while she's still considered a teenager. Um, yep. I think the the enlisted bit where you join the military. Um, I've been trying to think about how that would work. Um, and I think it makes sense that you were this in this like advisory position while the blood mist was still there. And once the blood yep. mist lifted, what I imagine is that um, perhaps you were part of a bigger, slightly one of the slightly bigger towns in in Raven's Land, Raven in the Ravenlands. Yeah. And um, potentially there was some raiding that started because I'm sure raiding would have started as soon as a blood mist lifted. And in retaliation, the town put together uh, some sort of armed militia to strike back or to defend themselves. And that's where you would have been like, okay, this is my opportunity to do something a little bit more exciting. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. So rather um, than... Because the one thing I didn't mention about the setting is that there aren't like kingdoms. There aren't... Um, there, there are ruins of old kingdoms and things, but there aren't currently like big cities or anything like that. This blood mist has isolated everyone. It's all very it's rural in feel, right? Without any kind of like overarching empire or camp or kingdom or anything interfering. It's very Wild West sort of style in that in that regard. So yeah, yeah. with her rank in the town, I would almost see her as potentially like a sergeant or a lieutenant type, lieutenant type role, um, a little bit more. Sure. guiding then on the front lines like i have sure. some martial ability yeah. but yep okay cool and that me also means you get a, um you're the only one of of the four who starts with some some armor and a helmet which is kind of interesting so it's a sorcerer <laughs> with armor yeah cool which is perfectly fine in this game yeah it goes right back to what you were saying before it's great yeah ed let's uh let's hear about your character. Right, um, so my guy, uh, who's called Sawaki, um, being uh, a fan of uh, uh, Finland's um, and obviously Free League, um, it is Sami for Birch, which will be quite nice. Um, uh, my friends call me Key, which makes it nice and easy. Um, grew up, um, he's a human, um, and he grew up as a herder, looking after reindeer. So spent a lot of his time out in the wilderness um, and pretty much learned his skills out there. Um, he, I think, um, befriended um, one of the other people. Um, so Harry, I think I befriended your mm -hmm. character while we were growing up. Um, but I basically, um, he went from being a herder to um, learning about expeditions and taking people into the wild so when the blood mist lift lifted he pretty much 
um, was one of the first people to go out. Um, he likes exploring. He thinks it's great. Um, he is always up for kind of seeing what's new, what's on the horizon. Um, so was very keen to do that. Um, and uh, he did that for pretty much most of the five years. Um, he is a keen archer um, and actually um, participated in um, uh, an archery competition um, and won a very nice bow um, with that. Um, so he's uh, not very great at uh, melee. Um, he's pretty much a uh, hunter and uses his bow probably most of the time for everything else. Um, he He's quite likable. He is an adult, um, so I think when we create characters, we could be young, adults, or old. Um, so he is an adult, so he's actually had a few bits and pieces that's happened to him in his life, um, which he doesn't really talk about. He's a bit quiet when it comes to things like that. Um, but he's uh, uh, quite capable when he's on his own or within a group um, to pretty much uh, be the person who's at the front, leading, um, showing what's going on, where to go, how to get to places. Um, so that's his pretty much his forte, really. Um, not a great fan of cities, and he's quite happy to stay away from anything that's larger than a very small village. Um, and is quite keen to learn about new things. Um, hence the the friendship with um, Harry's character. One thing about the blood mist I didn't mention um, is that it, it didn't affect children. Mm -hmm. So if people are wondering, like, how on earth would you become a, a hunter and a guide um, mm -hmm. with, <laughs> with something like the blood mist? Yeah. Theoretically, as a child, you could have ranged a little bit. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, that's what I would have done as a herder. Yeah, uh, exactly. Exactly. And, yeah, we won't get into the, the whole big discussion uh mm -hmm about um you know whether it's feasible that um herd animals would have survived 300 years in this apocalyptic event um, which <laughs> if you want to if you want to talk about that there's a forum post over on the official forums where you can get stuck right in uh -huh. we're gonna ignore that <laughs> um harry over to your character kark yes thank you <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at no, I've remembered. I was just achieved. trying to phrase the question of, um, without discussing my relationship to the other characters, it's hard to have much to say. Well, what are so what is who is Kark? Kark is a goblin who rolled the rolled the childhood background of being a feral child of the woods. So what I took from that was that literally Kark is a feral, like, grew up alone in the woods. Which, now that I'm hearing more about the blood mist, doesn't sound as straightforward, but I kind of like it. Um, Again, it did, wouldn't have harmed children. So I did notice on Wikipedia there's a list of feral children raised by animal. <laughs> um, so, anyway, and it... He's called Kark. He named himself after the sound that crows make. Uh, as a goblin, strong affinity with crows because I like scavenging. I like, you know, decaying corpses of various things, finding shiny bones, um, you know, rolling in streams, rolling in mud. Sound like typical goblin material there. Yeah. Um, so as a as a feral child of the woods, I, I you know, I grew up essentially utterly savage and uh, at some point bumped into Ed's character I guess mm -hmm. and uh, learned some rudiments of civilization somehow <laughs> for me I guess yeah yeah so they both they both rolled this there's like a, a table with like 20 <clears throat> options on how you how you met and they both mm -hmm. rolled childhood friends so and one of them Harry's Harry's character was a feral child of the woods and Ed's character was a hunter who liked the wilderness so it kind of it made such perfect synchrony mm -hmm. yeah. I like the idea that I'm like the the twisted little weirdo that you go out to talk to in the woods <laughs> and like you get back to the other herders and you're like oh yeah my friend Kark the, Kark is in the woods he's you know he's he's watching us from the trees and we're like oh yeah yeah sure he is yeah yeah <laughs> but he's real <laughs> he's real and That's he's it. hideous 
Yep. So, so yeah, I'm looking forward to playing an awful, awful goose of a creature. Cool. I'm looking forward to it as well. Um, um, I love goblins. I think I can't cool. promise that I won't do some goblin voices. I don't mind. Which might sound real weird in a microphone, but it's probably going to come out at some point. Yep. Um, I'm gonna. It's going to vary. <laughs> I kind of wanted to be doing the the group introductions as we're going through, which is which has worked quite well. So, um, in fact, Charlotte's character, Lyria, her connection to the group is primarily through Kark. Yeah, um, I believe since I was also rolled the enlisted background, um, and so did she. I got the impression that we were enlisted together in some kind of military outfit. You're feral. You're a fighter. That's your profession. So I can imagine that you probably were hired on as a mercenary for this town to help with something. Um, I'm guessing it's something like, hey, we're going to go and duff up that bunch of folks and uh, you're conscripted. Maybe. Sure. Yeah. But that's the idea is that you're both... Um, you both have this like military background element, and that seemed to be mm -hmm. like a good connection point for how you knew each other. I mean, it, it seems like a no-brainer, really. <clears throat> and last but certainly not least, we come to Eric, and Eric is not um, going to be talking about how he knows the no. the three mm. because this is going to be covered in our prologue. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I am going to be playing Arlek. Uh, Arlek is an Alderlander. Um, which is one of the two major uh, cultures of humans. Um, he grew up a herder. Um, and there's some idea that maybe he and Swaki know each other, and that might be a way that they might know each other, but I'll maybe. say no more. Um, <laughs> he, uh, he took a different path, though. Uh, he grew up around cattle and livestock, um, and of got into the business end of it uh so his profession in the game is peddler uh he's a young man uh i imagine he's very good looking and very sort of assured of himself he has sort of you know dark hair light eyes the sort of thing strong chin uh i have it written down that he has uh short mutton chops along the side <laughs> um because he comes from a cattle background it's not impossible. He might have a little twang. We'll see. Uh, and uh, he wears uh, he wears uh, boots laced up the front. He has like a little wool poncho. Uh, he'll be sporting. So yeah, he's a he's going to be a, a cocky son of a bitch. So we'll see. Uh, we'll see how he goes. Okay. Uh, yeah. One thing we didn't mention um, are. Animal companions. Two of you have animal companions. Eric, you're one of them. Oh yeah. Yes, I have. Uh, yeah. So Arlik has a donkey named Greta, a Jenny, um, and uh, yeah, I think that's as much as I want to say about Greta right now. Okay. And uh, Harry. I have an animal animal companion who is a goat. <laughs> has has. I haven't Car decided whether okay. the goat is a billy goat or a nanny goat. Okay. Once you've decided, I, I imagine you'll come up with a name too. Then uh, I vaguely wanted to call it Igor. Hang on, let me let me roll for this real quick. <laughs> if it's uh, if it's odds, it's a dude. And it's evens, so we got a got a nanny goat. What's a good name for a nanny goat? Nanny. I mean, it's got the virtue nanny. of simplicity. Lyria. <laughs> it's also the sound the sound of the goat mm -hmm. makes a little bit too. Which ties in with Kark. Ed yeah, just that's did true. A great... Ed, do you want to give the impression again? Nanny. <laughs> I didn't hear that the first time. No, How I, did I you didn't do quite that catch quiet? it again. I think there's some audio issue there. Really, really, yeah. really is there? Yeah. Oh, you know what? That was fabulous. Um, yeah. yeah. I am personally in real life very fond of goats. I think they're hilarious. I love goats. I love um, goats um, they've got too. funny faces and sweet little faces. I like their eyes. They're so very weird. Yep. So yes. I'm quite yep. excited to have an imaginary pet goat. Um, you know, technically, I've also got like a few animal companions. Mm -hmm. Their names are Arlek, Kark, and Key. Oh. <laughs> I'm gonna shit in your shoes. <laughs> That's what goblins do. Okay, cool. Um, <laughs> I I make no promises um, about the survivability of your two animal companions. I make no promises how... about Karen. <laughs> <laughs> um, they don't receive any special plot armor. I won't target them specifically, but, you know, we'll see. Um, okay. 
I do. Group concept then, um, I've kind of touched on it very slightly. Your your adventure is something is something is for whatever reason you have left your homes. You're all together, um, and apart from Arlek, Arlek is not with the th with the the three others of you. So the three mm -hmm. of you are out um, in the Ravenlands somewhere, adventuring around. Um, any ideas? What you're are you just just basically checking out what's happened after the blood mist lifted, and you know, making a name for yourselves as as kind of the book sort of suggests, or do you have any other any other ideas? I well, don't think it would be too far off from uh, saying that checking out some of the ruins that uh, have been found would be okay. far off from what we're doing. Like, I mean, we're not the best of people. So doing things for our own gain Checking yeah. ruins, finding stuff, selling it if we need well, not, be, or using it—not even it. necessarily ruins, right? Each each of you, apart from Eric, um, <laughs> I completely forgot about this. Each not of you have rolled up anyway. a, a legend. You have a legend that is that you've that mm -hmm. you have heard sometime in your in your background in your past. Um, so Eric, that's a bit of homework for you. Will be to roll up. Um, I'm sure you've done oh, it before, yeah. probably. Yeah, I'll do it. Roll up a legend, um, and that is basically potentially a hook for you to be wanting to go out and like the bloodness is lifted you've you've kind of grown sick of being around your your settlements wherever they may happen to be and you're like right let's get together strengthen numbers etc yeah that makes sense yep i think there's a good place in the northwest uh-huh i think the three of you all know of a place in the north so it seems things are pointing you towards the north north um, northwest yeah we'll see is it the north pole probably not um, and I think I'm just going to check my notes again because I think that's basically it and we're we're kind of over the one hour mark I wanted to I wanted to kind of stick to so um, um, the last thing so we're, I'm just going to mention this to, um, to the four of you now um, one thing that we forgot to mention when we were doing the character generation on discord um, initially um, was that after you've done your formative events you're allowed to if you want you can move one attribute point from one attribute to another. Okay. So, if if you want to do that, you're very very welcome to do that. Um, don't forget as well. So we'll do this before the prologue. Um, two skills. You get this two additional skill points. Um, just run them by me so, so I'm aware. But the only restriction is that they have to be on two different skills, and you can't increase a skill to beyond three. So you can go up to three, but not beyond that. Uh, for people listening who aren't familiar with the rules, skills can go up to five, no higher. So five is the maximum. Um, and I think that's it. I was playing with the idea of you each having a random piece of gear. <laughs> um, there's a bunch of tables for like loot, lots of them, and your um, it doesn't really come up in the random character generation. And to be honest, some of you are at your limits with how much encumbrance you have. So um, I think we're going to leave it. I think we're going to leave it. Um, although it is, I'll think about it. I'll think about it for the few minutes while you're coming up with all that and between when we're recording the prologue. But that's it from that's it from me. So again, um, if you want to check out how to, if you want to talk to any of us or get in touch with me about anything, you can always leave a comment in the comments below. Otherwise, links to all of the social media stuff are in the description so thanks very much for watching and um yeah very much looking forward to seeing how this goes and hope i hope you are yep. too thank you thanks everyone cheers bye <laughs>